pulled five grand out of my account, said yes, boom. Still working at Clio. Um, went back east, studied some patterns of urban housing, built a model. I was in the elevator up and down saying hi to everybody. Found a half million dollars of investors and got a construction loan, and we were on our way. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. And we made a million dollars on that project in one year. Just like that. <laughs> And so, the bank was only giving me $35,000 in architectural fees, just like that. <laughs> so throughout tonight, we'll talk about serendipity and just like that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, you told me a funny story, and, I, and I, have to, I have to ask you if it's actually true that, that you were getting a state honor award for seven on Kettner, and yet at that time you didn't have enough money in your wallet to pay your AIA food fees? Well, I, I kind of remember it like this. We always lived above the store. So we are in Seven on Kettner. We'd actually done real well, but we had taken our money, paid our taxes. That's a bad thing. And then bought the house. So um, I'm downstairs, and I just sort of got to know Teddy Cruz somehow, the world-famous Teddy Cruz. And uh, I got this phone call, and someone says, it's the AIA Sacramento. I was like, oh, shit. I can't afford to pay my dues. So do I really want to take this phone call? So, you know, being the stand-up guy, I took the phone call. Just, what, what, how am I going to dance around this? How am I going to pay the easy payment plan here? And she said, Jonathan, you just won a state honor award for Seven on Kettner. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. So it wasn't a collections call? No, it wasn't a collection call. That was still coming, but she did that. And then the funniest thing is then Teddy Cruz, I think he called me or I called him or something like that. The first thing he wanted to know was, it an honor award or merit? I didn't even know what he was talking about, but Teddy's so tuned into that. He knew all this stuff. And it was an honor award, and I went up there. Uh, we went up to the design, Monterey Design Conference there, like 4,000 people in this room. I'm in the back of this room. I have no idea what's going on because I'm not tuned into California architecture. And um, gosh, it must have been a five-hour walk from the back to the front of that room down those hardwood floors with my hard soles, click, 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 click. And I was a 26 years old at that time. So it was a big kind of culture shock as these things started to snowball and start moving forward. Just snowball. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. Um, I, think, I think the funny part of the story for me was if you couldn't pay something as, I guess, relatively small as your AIA dues, that must have been the beginning of some lean times for the Siegel family. Yeah, well, let's see. We actually made a million dollars, and I got half, and the partners got half. Um, and that was, that's the P word. That's the bad word, two partners. Um, the next deal, I worked two years. They think I made $65,000. So, I mean, the, 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 the ebbing and flowing of the income of the development world is pretty heroic. And uh, that was tough. You know, we sold all the units ourselves, and uh, it was a brutal event. It was a really, it went from, you know, top of the mountain to the bottom of the valley kind of thing. So, um, and obviously, your whole career, I'm sure, has been ebbing and flowing, but you have some unique... A lot more flowing these days. <laughs> You have some unique encounters with uh, investors, partners, and even the homeless. Right. That was just great. We, um, we, we went from the second product to the third product called the Brickyard, and we, um, we try, try not to practice urban removal. We try to save some of the buildings. So we're actually working in one of the brick buildings that uh, was on the site. It was actually where the lumber company had kept all their lumber. Um, and what I had done uh, in the recession, 1994, I had sold 18 units, pre-sold them, 18 units, custom designed 18 units, done all the drawings. Joe Wong actually did the construction drawings for me because that was a mandate from the investor, partners, whatever. And then managed the whole project. I had Wormer's construction doing it. I think my fee was around 100 grand for doing all that work. Huge fee. And at the end, four of them sued me because they thought I'd ripped them off and they thought I'd change money back and forth. And that was brutal. We went to uh, Europe. We hadn't had a vacation. I was probably working 75, 80 hour weeks. We hadn't had a vacation about a year. And the, um, the jackasses delivered the lawsuit the night before we went on vacation. You can imagine that. So partners are absolutely no fun. Did that begin a process of receding away from partnerships? Yeah, trying to just like <laughs> rub them off us. Um, you know, we still needed them and uh, we learned how to deal with them. My patience level's pretty, pretty nominal relative to that, but uh, we developed housing that we could keep and we developed the philosophy going forward that would keep our housing instead of selling it and not have partners. So, not on the partnership side, but you also had a run-in with another personality by way of the Moto Villas burning down. Oh yeah, the homeless, that was quite wonderful. Um, we were up in Idaho, 
my wife's from Idaho, we went to school in Idaho, so we go up every Christmas and we had a very um, kind of a very funny, sarcastic partner, investor, Mark Johnson, who was a great guy. And he, uh, God, what were we doing that day? In those days, I don't know if we had cell phones. No, he, he pasted on our door, you missed all the fireworks. Watch the news at 11. Okay, so we get home, we're living at the brickyard. We're building this property called Moda Villas. And lo and behold, there's the building burning down. A homeless guy had got into the project, used his Bunsen burner, and torched one of the buildings. So, And certainly, a lot of your career has been probably more so on the business side than most practicing architects. Right. Um, but it, it is at a root of your design, which is who is your favorite architect and why? And have they played a role in all these images that we're seeing besides, tonight. Besides Ted Smith, my favorite architect would be uh, Otto Wagner, who actually uh, did very similar to what kind of, I think I'm going to take some credit for Ted and I, what's happened in San Diego. Uh, he uh, created something called the secessionist movement in Vienna uh, in the turn of the century, and he basically went against Archduke Ferdinand, calling all the projects and how the design, the language, and the idioms were created. And uh, Otto Wagner figured out that he could do apartments and actually keep them and actually make money. Um, it was quite interesting, and he was all about um, removal of ornamentation. So he had his disciples that came with us, as sort of Ted and I have with, with Lloyd and Sebastian, and not to you know, say they're, they're under us, they're equal to us, uh, and, and Mike and Brett Farrell. Um, and I think it's kind of cool. I hope the legacy, you know, we look back in 50 years, we won't be here, but people look back and say, what a cool group these guys were, trying not to be great people, but trying to change the city by how they control their own destiny. So do you see that? I mean, obviously, you've seen these images more, more than anyone else in this room. But do you see that, histori that historical relationship in your own work? I mean, can you step back from it enough and say, yeah, there's, there's some lineage there? Or do you get wrapped up in, well, no one ever did that because you couldn't do that well, 100 nothing, years ago? Nothing's new. I mean, everything's based on something else. I mean, I... I was in England, I was telling Ted earlier at London, it was all about Ted. And it really, you start to look at some of the things that are there, people take elements of other work and bring it into their work. Um, and if you look at like the brickyard you show, this is the interior of our house. Um, you know, I love that building and I really despise that building. I had the partners that sued me and they took a lot of the stuff off the building. So they cut back things. They were in control and I think that's the secret to, at least for sure the secret to my success, whatever I have, it's controlling everything I do. And if you have no control, you have nothing. <clears throat> but you relinquished a certain amount of control with, uh, with Lind in Little Italy. You, you had a, a great partnership with other architects. You had a wildly different relationship with, with uh, city officials. Um, so you, you had experienced giving away a lot of control in a project. And yet you talk a lot about seizing control throughout your career. Um, how, does Lind, how does Lind play into that? Well, the Little Italy neighborhood development, that's Lind, um, started off with, um, this is how I see it, Ted. I started off with Mike and Glasso, and I always talk about wanting to do a demonstration block. And Mike and I got together. CCDC had purchased from um, this, these REOs from uh, the government um, in the early 90s, and this block here was available. And basically, Rob uh, was going to work for Mike Glasso and take the top, and I was going to take the whole bottom. And Rob said, well, I'm not going to do it unless Ted's involved. And Ted said, gee, that's a little big for me. So bring Jimmy Brown in, and then all of a sudden, Robin Breezewall came in, Kathy came in, and, and um, Lloyd started working with Ted. So this kind of wonderful event happened. Marty Poyer sort of was the glue that put it all together, because we were all kind of crybabies whining about the whole, you know, I want this, I want that. Um, but I think the push and pull was really magic. 